first have a literary swag book club meeting. <laughs> first have a screening time literary swag into the book club. I mean, first, I would like for everyone, if there's any negative spaces in the front row, could this please make the space more intimate? It looks, it looks better for pictures too. <laughs> you know, it definitely creates the illusion that, yeah, look that, there was way more people here. <laughs> and then to give space for people that come in late to just, you know, fill the back row, so please bring it in. I think I'm going to pull a chair at the top. I can pull a chair right there at the top. All right. All right, so, um, can everyone see me? Can everyone, can everyone see me? Where they sit? So, to give a little background of how this all came to be, um, last year, uh, starting around June, I had seen a, a kid on a train, a little black kid on a train, probably like 14, 15, wearing green headphones, some, you know, some Adidas kamikazes, some army fatigue pants, flannel shirt, and he was reading To Kill a Mockingbird. And I was looking at him, and I thought, like, he probably was reading after school, so I didn't pay him no attention. And I looked back over at him throughout the, you know, the course of the train ride, and I saw like, like nothing was kind of pulling his attention away from that book. And it was just that image that like, I took the picture, and I just put it up, and I put literary swag, and I thought nothing of it. And then I started to think of something of like, well, what if I just started taking pictures of people reading? And just like, anytime I saw somebody reading, I just took a picture, and I posted it. And then I hit some of my friends up, and I'm like, yo, if you see people reading, post a picture. And they were like, yeah, I got you. And then I ain't seen no pictures. <laughs> so I was like, you know what? Money speaks more than anything. So that's how I started the literary swag competition. And so last year, the first one, it was just the rule was you post the most pictures, I give you $1,000 in cash with a big check. And so uh, it's actually good because we have like people that, that are like everyone is like full circle. So like the first year, uh, it was Anthony and Kyle going at it for the title. He posted like 1,400 pictures, and then he posted 1,600, and then he came back with 17, and then on the last day he came back with 2,100. <laughs> and I'm on the other end reading, like trying to count these pictures, and I literally in my head was like, after like 300, I'm just, I'm gonna just round it. And so, because it's like he won. Like it was like, there's no, it's not close enough to see to for a margin of error. So the first year's literary swag competition winner was Kyle Chisholm. So, and so what I did was I always wanted to, um, I, I've always been a fan, fan of pageantry, and so I got the big check. And then at the last minute, when I was buying the check, or buying other people, the finalists, uh, thinking of what to do for the finalists, I was like, let me, it's not, it wouldn't make any sense for them to just get money. I would have to add some literary quality to it. So basically, I added the whole step, like the, like the additive of you get a book of your choice under forty dollars because the hundred thousand was already killing me, and I had to like scale that in. So um, I think the first book he got was Native Son, and I gave it to him. And this is what touched my heart about it was within a week he had finished it, and then within a week he gave it to somebody else to read. And the whole purpose of it was for that experience to open up that doorway for people to enjoy literature and get access to literature they wouldn't they would have never had access to otherwise. And so the whole point of literary swag is to allow for people to get access to like a native son Richard Wright or to Kill a Mockingbird or like you know a Ta-Nehisi Coates or like a Claudia Rankin or like even like a Ella Ferrante. Elena Ferrante. Elena Ferrante. Ferrante Fever. You know, and so it's just to see that sort of mix of a kid, you know, with, you know, Adidas on, wearing Tana, you know, reading Tanasi Ta coats, and then you see the kid with, you know, Skechers on or whatever, he's raring, and then he's reading James Baldwin, and then you see, like, you know, a little girl, like, reading a Harry Potter book bigger than her. It's just to see those images really does something. I always, that, that's what the whole point of the pictures were. And then it kind of mushroomed a little bit more, you know, enter, you know, my man John Midgley, who takes the pictures for like Brooklyn Circus, 
and then I'm able to go to Liberty Fairs and then I get pulled by Articles of Style for a profile. That Articles of Style profile turns into a BuzzFeed profile. And that's when like the real the wheels really started turning. And then go back a little bit, but then go forward, Jason Reynolds is in the room, he's a writer. He was the first person who ever did one of the, he was the first person to do the My Literary Swag video with the three writers and the three designers. And I was at his book reading, and I was like, you know what would be dope if, you know, the same way when you watch Chant, like on E, and they go, what are you, who are you wearing, Brad Pitt? And they're like, oh, Chivon Chi. I was like, what if I asked writers, who are they reading and who are they wearing? And so you kind of get like this snapshot of who a person is by their literary and fashion taste. And so from him, it just started to go into like, he turned into Claudia Rankin, who turned into Roxanne Gay, who turned into Juno Diaz, who just, and it keeps turning. And that's sort of like the beauty of it. And then it started to expand outward to the fact that like, I'm including like, I got Remy Martin to do one. And you know, I'm, I'm getting other people who are like, now they're like, oh, like, I didn't even know like Remy Martin liked Stephen King. And it was like, that's another reason why literary swag exists, is to show you that the people you don't even think are reading are reading. And so, fast forward a little bit more, over the summer, I'm riding the train, set the scene. I'm sitting across <laughs> from the weeping lady from Orange is the New Black, right? And I'm looking at her, and I'm like, that's the lady from Orange is the New Black. <laughs> and so I walk over to her, and I'm like, you're that lady from Orange is the New Black. And she was like, yes, I am that lady from Orange is the New Black. <laughs> and then we started talking, and I, explained, I, you know, I explained to her what the literary swag thing was about. And she was like, this is really interesting. And so she did a video. We, we actually did a lot of those videos, when they get, they get posted, it's 15 seconds. But the graciousness of everyone that does it, and like Robin can attest to it, it takes way longer. It takes at least. 10 to 20 minutes to do it. And so the fact that people are gracious enough to give me time that they don't owe me is like, that's an another part that's special about it. But she gave me that video, she posted it, and we were talking back and forth, and she was like, you should start getting into reading plays. And anybody who's been following me knows that I've been coming to Strain, AKA The Trap, for a long time, <laughs> right? And so we were in a Twitter conversation. I told her, I'm going to Strain to get some books. She retweeted it. Strain hit me up. They like what's going on. <laughs> we need some of that over here. So we met up, and then I need I need uh, Whitney and Colleen to kind of like stand up because this is where it gets real. This is, this is it gets real. I said, Whitney, please stand up for just a second, just a second. It's not too long. You're not gonna take too much of your time. And so enter the trap, and they come in, and we sit down, and we're like, we won't like. Let's work together. Let's make something that's special. Let's do something that's like you know. Just let's do something. And I told them I wanted a book club, and and this is what like you know I, I love the idea of the circle because you know it was because of John Mitchell that I was able to join a book club, and then the book club gave me the sort of aesthetic, cultural conversation that I had been missing when I was a part of BSU and like I have you know people from like my undergrad experience who can attest to what that was about, and it was just. You know, to be in a room where you had people that were talking and challenge you, challenge your ways of thinking and your ways of being, your ways of living, it was like, how could I create that for more than 12 people? How could I kind of maximize that experience for as many people to get into a room and have a conversation about books and about different things? And like, and also allow it to be a space that you feel like you want to be a part of because it's, you know, most things with book clubs is like, when you create a book club, most people are readers or they're at a certain level of awareness where they all read and they have the same sort of like, you know, like an X or Y change there, pretty much the same. And I always wanted to create a space that was open for somebody who did not read, that could feel like, well, maybe I would want to check out what's happening tonight and they could walk in and not feel like they had to read the book to be a part of the space. And so that's another reason for this. So now, what this is and what we're a part of is if when you ever go to a you know a reader's talk or an artist talk and it's a two hour event and you know there's a moderator and there's the person who's talking or panelist and for two and for an hour and thirty hour forty five minutes they talk you sit and you listen and depending on who it is it's brilliant but the last fifteen minutes when you have these questions you probably get two people who really get their questions out and they're like all right it's done and so you're just sitting there reeling with conversation. And then it's like, you're sitting, you're looking at people, hoping they look back at you and like, I was thinking, I was thinking that too, man. And so what the Literary Swag Book Club is, is the last 15 minutes 
of those events extended into two hours. It's to give people the opportunity to have those discussions with each other. And so, like, when we were talking about who we should get to come to these events, and we were, it was a big thing of, like, oh, could we possibly get Tana Hassan to come? And I was like, I'm a tribe. <laughs> and now it's like, you can't no more. Like, you can't talk to that man. It's like, you gotta talk to 18 men before you talk to him. Right. It's like, it's real with him now. But the whole point of it was, I wanted to provide a space where writers would come, who are like well, well known, well published, and where a person off the street can come in and no one feel ostracized or feel alienated because of who else was in the room. And I wanted people who were in the room to feel that the room was important because they were there. Not because Tani Issa would come, not because, you know, like a Juno Diaz would be here, it's because you're here. And so like Literary Swag Book Club is about the people in the room, not any one person. So even me as a part of this club, like I am not the club. Because y'all see, like if y'all are not here, this gets shut down, I go home and I do an angry rant on, the, on the Instagram. <laughs> but the, because y'all are here, the conversation is, a, is, is, is allowed, like it's allowed. So thank y'all for being able to be here tonight for the first meeting. And I wanted to open it up, oh wait, I gotta go into blessing. I wanted to go into sort of like the ground, you know, sort of like you know, rules of decorum about how we go about this. Um, being at this a book club, open to like you know free discussions about you know race politics class but i also ask because of the amount of people in the room and because of the varying degrees of viewpoints if you could reel it back to the book as much as possible you know because i that, that's what this is about at the end of the day so this is not like a covert way for you to sprouse you know your <laughs> political affiliations or your manifestos or to even sell your book. This is a way this is, a, this is like, yeah, you know, in my, in my book, you know, that's coming out October 18th. We, and so it really is. All right, yeah. Thursday. So it's, it, we really just want it to be a space where, like, the book is being brought to life by the people, by other people's narratives. So whatever you say, please keep it to the book. Also, a lot of people in this room, everybody's different age ranges, different cultures. We're, we're not going to agree. That's perfectly fine. But what's important is that we respect what we don't agree with. There should be no reason why a disagreement should turn into anything else besides that. So if you don't agree with them, the other part of this event, oh, like the way this goes, is the, like of the two hours, the last 30 minutes is sort of like then open so that if you disagree with somebody, you can speed line to that person and y'all could do that in the corner. But like to distract sort of the larger conversation or what people are pulling from is sort of like selfish. So I just really want people to be aware of like when they, they got some heated things they want to say and they see they can't solve it in the context of the 130, do that in the last 30. They got cheese and wine, y'all could do that all night, or at least for 30 minutes. So I wanted to open sort of the conversation about the book with, ironically, a video that has been going viral last night. I'm not looking, there's no video. <laughs> but there's, there was a video last night that uh, went viral, and it was of a white man who had gotten hit. He was jogging in Brooklyn, downtown Brooklyn. He got hit with a stroller by a, 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 like a, a yuppie, you know, upper middle class white woman. And he said, excuse you. And she said, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. And so it got, it, it blew up, and then the father was with her. And then he said to him, they're going, he's like, I'm gonna kill you. Now, mind you, there's a cop there. So like the fact that he's threatening him just completely is null and void. But what was interesting about what he said was, this is white privilege what you're doing. And then he said, I, I love this part. He said, if it wasn't for white people like me who settled this area first, you wouldn't be here. And I was like, what? <laughs> it was just, it was, it was like watching that first that Dave Chappelle Clayton Bigsby skit where the white guy thinks he's, where the black guy thinks he's white. It's just like a white guy telling a white guy that he's white. No, he's just, it was, I was like, oh man. And so, what to come to bring it to the book? This is like sort of like the whole arc of it to bring it to the book. Um, in the first, the opening of it. Uh, Turn your pages, it's sort of going to be like a Baptist church too. Uh, <laughs> turn your pages to Corinthians 20, no, uh, you turn your, turn your Ta-Nehisi to page 7, <laughs> to, the, to the bottom paragraph. Um, we start with, the new people were something else before they were white. 
Catholic, Corsican, Welsh, Mennonite, Jewish. And if all our national hopes have any fulfillment, then they will have to be something else again. Perhaps they will truly become American and create a nobler basis for their myths. I cannot call it. As for now, it must be said that the process of washing of disparate tribes white, the elevation of the belief in being white, was not achieved through wine tasting and ice cream socially, but rather through the pillaging of life, labor, liberty, and land. Through the flaying of backs, the chaining of limbs, the strangling of dissidents, the destruction of families, the rape of mothers, the sale of children, and various other acts meant first and foremost to deny you and me the right to secure and govern our own bodies. And sort of what, when you watch that video, or when I watched the video, what I saw was like the politics of interaction, of interaction between, between bodies. But what I was also watching, I think that video showed it better than anywhere else is because this was the first time in which there was an absence of bodies of color, which immediately sort of like changed the narrative about, well, this is just a race issue, this is not something else. So to see a white body make another white body aware, not only of its whiteness, but the limitations of its whiteness, meaning you cannot hit me with your stroller. I say excuse you and then you say fuck me, that's not the way this works. Like, part of why you're even able to hit me with the stroller is because I'm here. And I made it safe for you to hit me with the stroller. And to make somebody aware of that is sort of, you know, what the larger theme of the concept of the book of the dreamer is. It's the person who kind of exists bodiless in society, who moves through society kind of, you know, hitting people with strollers, running people over, bumping people and then looking at them like they bump them. And so, I mean, this is not a monologue. So please, y'all read the books too. Y'all got some thoughts, share, you know, what y'all what y'all kind of pulled from it in context of like the body. And yeah. John. I thought we we didn't have that in the black. Well, I thought it was multicultural, but black American friends might have got to England and say, there's no black people. Yeah. Where are the black people? Anyway, but what was interesting is the body, the body language, the body dynamic, the, and the history. So in England, we had a class structure that still exists. So you're working class, you're therefore you're poor, and therefore you're seen as ignorant, uh, and violent, and dangerous. And it's not the same as being black in America, but there was there was some similarity. There was this history, of Jews, history of uh, disenfranchising, and the resentment towards what you perceive to be the ruling class. Okay. Even though the same skin colors, you could find them and point them out just by the accent of their voice, the way they spoke, the way they dressed. There was this, and there was intense hatred of you know, those that you deemed to see, they were seen to perceive to be. They had it easy. They had it easy. You did not. And it was also sort of you know, the working class hero, the guy that would go out and you know, do good, but keep his working class roots, but be angry. And you know, I, I, I grew up you know, watching all this, and I was neither rich nor poor, and I was neither the really upper class nor working class. I was kind of in this middle ground, but watching it from both ends, because I was neither stuck in the projects or the council states, and neither. Rich outside, and I just felt that from both from all sides, there was just all this anger and hatred. It was so pointless. It really was so pointless. And these guys had said they were like they would be my peers. They'd grow up still angry, angry and resentful of the people they perceived they had. And yet they had become themselves rich, successful, and you think they'd be happy. But they weren't. There was still this anger and resentment towards them. It seemed to be the the growing class. And, and it's, even though race is a much stronger issue, a much deeper issue, a much bigger issue, there is a similarity to Tatan as he goes to dialogue. And it sends to you. He, he's aware of his anger. He's aware of his child, and he's afraid that he's imparting all this anger and fear, and ultimately fear, onto his child. But you, and I haven't finished. But you feel the anger. should have said that, man. But he has, he has resolved that anger within himself. Yeah. And it's, it's good, the dialogue is great, but at some point, you hope for him, the son, that he goes beyond the end. He can still understand the history, the relevance, and everything else, but can be able to just feel much more passionate for life. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so, I read the Um, you know, there is no joy. 
I think that there's a part where his son, he um, talks about how his son uh, is viewing the Michael Brown coverage on TV and then just kind of retrieves into his own space to kind of deal with how he was feeling about that. And I felt, at least the way I read it, felt like he, um, the author, kind of conceded in that moment that it was his responsibility as his father to tell him that whatever sentiments that he had or expectations of this world before he saw that happen was historically inaccurate. <laughs> or almost as if I understand the, the optimism and um, I guess safety net that you thought that you had. Um, but it wasn't really that to begin with, then maybe I should let you know that. Um, and that's the way I kind of read it. I didn't feel like um, it was it was hopeless or anything like that. I felt like it was just really raw. I felt like it was really, you know, besides the overall, besides the sense, what I, how do I say this? I don't think he was trying to tell his son what to believe as much as he was just telling his son, his son what existed and leaving it up to him to decide how he took it. Even in the parts where he was talking about how some black people retreat to faith as a solace to deal with all the heaviness, um, even though he's an atheist, but he offered that as a way you can pray if you want to. Play. That's not my thing, you know, um, I don't believe. Uh, there was a review that Michelle Alexander, she yeah. published the New Jim Crow, and she wrote about the book, and she said that when she first read it, you know, and it, you know, there's this overarching uh, comparison to Baldwin. You know, read on the back of the book, you know, Toni Morrison says, you know, since Baldwin died, I was looking for the intellectual void that would fill it, and so it's enter Ta-Nehisi with this. And Michelle Alexander, you know, read it more or less as, like, this book offers no escape from, you know, the thing about Baldwin, when if you read, you know, The Fire Next Time He Writes to His Nephew, the thing Baldwin does rhetorically is that he kind of gives you that. And because he was a pastor at 14, and that's his background, you know, he gave you that in the end, this will sort of like, you know, this is going to, you know, like there's no water, there's fire next time, this will burn. And because of, and you think about the politics, like 1960 Christian, you know, homosexual, where he is, and then you think now, 2014, 2015, atheist, but then, you know, sort of like a black Pan-African real point that the, the, the message is the same, the language is, is completely different. So he's still in part in that sort of hope, but the language of hope is different. So it's not quoting the Bible anymore. It's about the body, because what we've seen so much and on video is the body be destroyed. We're not seeing sort of like the aftermath of the body, whereas like you look and you turn on and then you see the pictures of the lynchings, or you see the, like the dogs being bitten. What you're seeing is people being killed on camera. So like, there was no footage of the actual lynching taking place in front of your eyes. We actually have a Daniel Pantaleo choking out at Eric Garner in front of our eyes, and we still have a society that's saying, not guilty. And then you have, you know, a Ray Tenzing putting his gun in the window of a Sam Du Bois and shooting him in the head, and you're like, eh, well, what did he do? And sort of like, so the narrative about the dreamer is like, this is what the dreamer does. It creates any narrative it can. Whether it be, well, he stole the cigars, or whether it be, well, she shouldn't have been talking back. Or why were they at that pool party? Right. It's just, it's not about looking at, well, why is this grown man's knee in this girl's back? Mm -hmm. And so the language of it is like her body, let's not talk about politics, her actual body is being threatened with a knee in her back. And you want to talk about, well, let's talk about before this video started. Right. How do we know? What she is like, but you have the footage. And so, I mean, anybody, like I said, I don't want to, please. Yes, Jason. I, I think, I mean, I have, a, I have, uh, I've read it twice, and I've been trying to, like, process it all. I mean, one, I think that, I also disagree, but I, 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 but
Tallahassee is now a superstar, right? The way that Jamie Ball is a superstar, and I think what happens sometimes is everybody gravitates toward these words and this work and, they, and this doctrine as, 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 as law, as if, as if we are a monolith, and we're not, right? And so it's, even though we can look at like all the things happening in our country, the truth is that, yeah, I come from exactly where you, I come from the neighborhood in which he's talking about, right? Like I, I'm from Washington, D.C. I remember Prince Jones, Prince Jones' death. I remember Gary's, Gary died in my best friend's sister's arms, right? I remember these things. So for me, it's very sort of visceral because that was my reality as a poor black kid growing up in America. Not everybody comes from that environment. Not everybody deals with those things. The truth is that I wish we, like I'd like to believe that every black person is dealing with the same shit. It's just not necessarily the case. And I think we have to make sure that we make that clear, right? That, that it is not, we are not a monolith. We do not all share the same experiences. Skin folk don't always mean kin folk, but we know these, <laughs> right? We know these. First of all, second of all, what I find most fascinating about is about this text is I think he took an interesting approach in talking about the body, which is something that most black scholars uh, and journalists and writers over the years have not done, um, like done like major sort of body work. But I do, and I think he's brilliant. I think the book is brilliant. But I do sort of wish that he talked a little bit more about how the the beating of the body um, and like the, the abuse of the body is sort of like this big thing, but it's nowhere near as big as sort of what happens to the psyche. Uh, and I don't think he like I don't think he does enough uh, enough sort of digging when it comes to psychological injury, right? And when he's talking because what, what we're really looking at is literally an expose of a man who has been psychologically injured because of what he's witnessed in terms of the abuse of the black body. And, and instead of sort of like diving into like, son, what, he, he mentions it in the part where he's like, son, I am broken, I am bruised, I am beaten, I am, I'm afraid, all these things. And I think like, that's sort of the crux of the book that I wish he would kind of dig into. Like, oh, all this shit I've been through as a kid, all that, you and I have talked about things, and we all have our things. My body, and the effects of this had on my body, and like watching my brother get beaten, watching all these people die and all this stuff, has affected me psychologically in a way that is far worse than, than any bruise or any beating or any beating by a police officer. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the one thing that is wrong with it. Right? Psychological injury, almost all of it shit. The minute you watch TV and you see a knee in the back of a little girl, it doesn't matter if you're from that hood or not. It doesn't matter if you ever had a knee in your back. You are injured. You are injured, right? Black, white, or indifferent. And I and I, I kind of that's the one thing I, I wish that he could have, like, because he has the he has the chops more than anybody right now to get in there, and I just feel like he kind of left it like, oh, like the body was the framework almost to a fault. I feel like that's part of the issue of the book, though. It's interesting that people keep calling back to James Baldwin, because I feel like this book, in a large part, is the future of telling you something. Um, and a big part of the conflict in the book is that how do you explain that to your kids? Like, if you could just barely comprehend the book itself, how do you even begin to explain that sort of psychological?
in touch with what you were saying, because you said... No, 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 I also grew up that way, like the past six years I've been living in Park Slope, Brooklyn, so like you said, it's never... I did not know that. <laughs> yeah, like I lived in... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so they know, like, I was never rich and all poor, so I can understand what you're saying, like, that lower class day, because I do feel like that sometimes, like, like, it's like you're so close and so far. And then I can also say what you were saying about growing up in that environment, because before I moved to Park Slope, I used to live in a stop. So I already, I know how it is. I know... It's busy. It's like that sometimes. And to touch on what you were saying about how to have how to have a conversation. Look at her. Look like an idiot. What you were saying about having a conversation with a child of color. I mean, us as black men. I don't know. A lot of us seem young, so I don't know if we reach that point in life. That I don't know where to get that. Point. You have a child? Oh. So it's like. It's crazy because like we're honestly, like you said, it's still to a point where you're right. We don't know what to say. We can only go by what we have. And like, he's going through something completely different than me. Like how, he, like in all life, so I'm gonna be honest, all the stuff that's going on, I have never experienced in my life. I've never had a cop stop me. I've never had a knee to my back. I've never had any close personal friends of me get killed. Today was the first time I've lost Somebody not, they didn't die, but they went to jail. That's the first friend. That's like a first close personal person I ever had go to jail my life. So like you were saying, we're forced, it's forced, it's like our destiny kind of, just the way the world is gone, that we're forced to have these conversations. And his conversation might be completely different from mine. His conversation, his con all, you know, I'll come to mine would be like, you know, you mind your business, walk down the street, you cool. His might be, yo, you got to you gotta look behind your shoulder. Don't go out a certain place. Like I'll tell my son, don't go to a certain neighborhood. Like personally, me being from Brooklyn, I would tell my son to go to Brownsville. I'm cross over in Manhattan all the time. I feel safe there. I personally don't feel safe going to Brownsville two o'clock in the morning. I don't know what's gonna happen. And there's some people, and there's some people going outside at the time of the night by themselves, and they feel absolutely comfortable. So, like you're saying, it's like you said, you're trained to talk to kids. So it's like I think about that now. All the stuff that's going on. Guns, everything like that. I was like, I have to explain this to my kid. I'm 24, I'm getting to that age where I want to do that. And it's like, I have to explain to him. Like, I have to think differently. Like, I can't tell him, well, I'm just going to do that, right? Nobody's going to screw with you. Nobody screwed with me growing up. Like, I have to tell him, like, yo, daddy had it good. But there's a lot of brothers that's what, that came up, that I came up with, that got shot, got sad. Police brutality. There's people I have no personal connection with. <laughs> it honestly comes back to mind. That's what it comes to. It's like we all share this lineage and we all have to share it. And even if it may not happen, we have to still be aware of it. Whatever color you are, you have to be aware because that's the only way you can change. Like, oh, you know, I can say there's no white privilege, oh, blah, blah, blah. Some people feel like we're over exaggerating. I remember, like, we get slapped, picked cotton. For years. For years. Getting slapped in bigger cotton. Getting slapped with women. That cotton, bro. For years. And it's like somebody is not even like it's, it's not even like, okay, cool. We had pictures. It's documented in history. And you still want to dispute it and say, well, this is our birthright. And then I seen a lady on the train the other day, shirt. She had a shirt on. It said big <laughs> cup. Like the big, I posted on, it's like the biggest terrorist is 1492, it's a picture of Christopher Columbus. And it's like, you're gonna sit there and say, we're horrible because we look different. We're horrible because we're not from here. And you're not even from here. And there's people that was dogging you here before that was almost as dog as us. <laughs> but you wanna sit here and say, we're, you know, you wanna, it's just crazy. So it's like, like you said, like you're trained to touch other, so it, that's how it is for us. And like people who have this conversation, like my father passed, so I didn't have somebody have this conversation. I had to figure this all out on my own. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor
so as a parent, your one only goal is to instill the certain survival skills for your kids to be as successful as possible. Before there was society, you got to teach them how to hunt, teach them how to eat, and that's it. So now it, the narrative has, has changed, and basically it's having to deal with the actual world that we're in. Um, and I don't think, and I think that's why you didn't, um, wasn't that much on the mental about it, because your mental ain't there, your body's gone. So, the most important part is, God, like you said, we're all mentally damaged, so I'm not even going to partner on that. <laughs> you got to make yeah, sure, yeah. you got to make sure you survive. And, and basically, like, he, he said it, like, he doesn't really take it person. I feel like he doesn't really take it that person. Because he was so, towards the end of the book, he says, I mean, basically, what I'm trying to say is, in the beginning of the book, he started off with the reason why he wanted to write the letter, because the whole mic went yeah. The kid, and his son went into the room. So now he was like, what do I tell him? He, 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 had, he, he felt that his son felt he needed to do something about it. And towards the end of the book, he explains it to him that he did this whole book to tell him that it's not your job to do anything about it, mm -hmm. to live your life. Mm -hmm. Because this it is, it is it's what we say nowadays, facts. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's facts. This yeah. is what it is. So don't oh, don't yeah. run it too much on it. Just understand that, every, that there is a world out there and find in your world and live your life. Yeah. And it's your choice if you want to do, but don't ponder too much on trying to change it because the dreamers are going to dream regardless. Yeah, all right, let me just, because yeah, you, okay. you got your hand. So there were a lot of things that we say in the course of this discussion, sorry, that kind of resonated with me, and I think you tipped it off with me initially. Because I think, so, full disclosure, I haven't fully read the book. I just came up with these. Why do you keep saying that? Yeah. But, you know, the whole world is here, so I had to be a part of the conversation. Now, one of the things I thought was most striking to me is within this book, he allows his son to make his own decisions. That's why he didn't get into the psychological piece of it. That's why it doesn't seem like there is any hope necessarily. Because I think with the micro incident, how his son reacted to it, what I got from that was, though they are different ages and grew up in different spaces and time and experiences, there is this collective hurt that father and son are both experiencing. And as a result of that, I, as a father, have to explain this to you because you don't understand what this means. And I've kind of been there. And here we are so many years later. And you think and hope and you're wondering you know, you say, I hear all the time, you've come such a long way, but have you really? I have to explain these things to you because your innocence is gone. I'm about to send you out into the world, so I need for you to understand how to navigate the space that you are in. And I think that said a lot to me because these are conversations that I, growing up, you know, even where I did, Camden, New Jersey, didn't have to have some of these conversations because I had a tribe around me that shielded me from a lot of that stuff where I had family members themselves that went to jail that you know got locked up and all that other stuff. I had that protection and that, under, that understanding of how to navigate those spaces or just kept away. What I take away from this book so far, and my ears are getting hot because uh, it really resonates with me, is this need to explain to our children the space that they're in without being prescriptive of how to navigate within that space because you do make of it what you will. And you know, you are not a dreamer, you live in the real world, but you can create your own reality in reference to protecting your body and the bodies of those that are closest to you. So, I mean, I'm just going to, just to bridge it. Um, so, there's a point, and I think like, y'all all started to like hover around it, and it's sort of, you know, this distinction between the body and the dreamer. And, on page 49, uh, at the bottom, he starts off, what did I mean specifically by the loss of my body? And if every black body was precious, a one of one, if not was correct, and you must preserve your life, how could I see these precious lives as simply a collective mass as the amorphous residue of plunder? How could I privilege the spectrum of dark energy over each particular ray of light? These were notes on how to write, and thus notes on how to think. The dream thrives on generalization. When 
limiting the number of possible questions or privileging immediate answers. The dream is the enemy of all our courageous thinking and honest writing. And it became clear that this was not just for the dreams concocted by Americans to justify themselves, but also for the dreams that I have conjured to replace them. And I think that where this book kind of <clears throat> operates is also the complicity that even the black bodies have with the dreaming. That we create our own dreams, like we create respectability politics, for example. We create, do you like Malcolm or Martin? Like, you have to pick one, but it's like, look at how they're, like they both ended. This, their bodies were taken more or less the same way. But it was like, but no, it's like, but if Malcolm would have lived, or if Tupac was still here, like you have all these sort of tan, like this, these tangent realities that are created to sort of, like as a coping mechanism, but then when does that coping become a, its own form of escape? To the point where even you are now like becoming a dreamer in your black body. And so now when you're sort of forgetting that your body is like, is black or, and I think that one of the things that he talks about with the body, and I think that, and a lot of reviews talked about how this book sort of neglected in a lot of, a lot of overt, overt ways, and he talks about the black woman's body, the female body. If, and this is like some people, and this is the purpose of these conversations, the conversation, the whole concept of the body as being a concept is, femi is, is a manifestation of feminist writing. So before feminist writing, there was no such thing, whether it be white feminist, black feminist, the conversation about bringing attention to the body was a, is, was, is a feminist act. So, and if there's no one else who knows what it's like to be in their body as women because they're constantly being, being made aware of it, street calls, cat calls, all types of things, hide this, show this more. And so I think that one of the things that this book puts you in conversation with is the sort of immediacy and urgency of existing. And even as a man, like as a black man, like, you know, I have the privilege of like not of walking down the block and sort of like not caring how I look. And then like at the same time, there's a woman from the time she goes out the door, she has to be prepared for everything that she is not prepared for. Because even when you wear the baggy dress, you might get, damn, she ugly. And it's like, I didn't even ask for that, but you're going to get it. And so, you know, navigating, if you're dreaming, you're like, well, I should be able to wear what I want to without getting that. Now, in the land of dreamers, yes, but in the land of my body, is, a, is like, I'm gonna be, like I have to protect my body in all ways. You have to create some sort of schema that you think will protect you. And I think that that's sort of like, you know, in a sense, what I see him playing out is like, this, these are the ways I've tried to do it. And I think that even like the way in which the book is being read by a lot of people is that like, he doesn't provide that solution. Like that, what are we supposed to do? And I think that what, in what he says in the book, and like, I don't know exactly where it is, but he was like, the whole point of this question is a bunch of series of open-ended answers. I don't know. And I think that this is one of the brilliant things about this book is that even in the narrative about what it is to be a dreamer, he refuses to dream, which means he refuses to give you that clean ending to the book where you go, all right, that was a good read. Time to go about my life. It was like, oh, damn. like. Yeah, exactly. Like you kind of have to live with it and then you have to kind of go back to it. And that's what living is. It's like when you forget your body, you kind of have to be brought back to it. And that's why like sort of like before I go into your comment, Robin, like that moment between, you know, those two white men on the, on the, on the street resonated because it was like it was a white man making another white man aware of his body. And that like, you know, so. Well, I, I was going to connect with that what we were talking about earlier. The parent thing really interesting in the way he makes this transition from the way he was brought up, the way he was parented, and he's very compassionate to his own parents, but to me it sounded pretty brutal. I understood it. And at, at the very end of the book, he said, I wish I could find it again, he said that he learns from his wife to hug and kiss and tell his son, I love you. Well, that just undid me completely. And, you know, does that, does that come in the category of dreaming? Or is that in the category of the body? Or is that the, ultimately the message that we yeah, take yeah, away yeah. from the book? Because I didn't feel it was, we didn't finish it. It was a spoiler, and I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
might have had this experience, white privilege, yada yada, I don't know. But I mean, I thought that that was just a, a beautiful moment. Well, that's, that, that, that was kind of case. I was trying to finish up the point is that, you know, once you've gone, once you've seen all of that, you've got to that, you've got to that, that point now where he's, he's privileged. Yeah. And, and in American yeah. society, as soon as you're rich, you're upper class. I, I know the body. Yeah. I know the right body. Yeah. 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 The target's a bag of money.
sort of buying himself and that sort of grudge, like, I kind of had to get that from both that character. I kind of love <coughs> this conversation because reading this book, a lot of these things kind of played in my mind. And, um, I didn't have anyone to talk to. About it, so this is kind of but um, in regards to the parent, I never got the conversation. I don't think my brother ever got the conversation. We were just Ghanaian Americans. And, um, and I think it's so hard now because with children, um, because Instagram and YouTube and the news, sometimes you are met with these things and your your child sees it before you do or what have you. And you don't even get it. You know, you don't even get the chance to explain to them beforehand that this is this is the world. And I think um, that's kind of what happened here with the, the Mike Brown incident. Was like his son. It was very clear that they provided a lifestyle for him that. I actually never didn't even get when he was growing up. And I think that's a, an amazing thing and how most parents want to do that for their child is provide more for them than they had. Um, and maybe he didn't think that he was going to have to touch on something this deep so soon. Um, and so I think that that's something that our parents, even when I was growing up, my mother didn't have to deal with because I, I wasn't watching the news when I was six or seven. I didn't care about these things. But because everything is so readily available, you can hear something well enough before you even understand what it could mean to be racially profiled or somebody getting shot. And then to kind of go back to your statement um, about people, us A, not being a monolith, um, and having different experiences, but um, when that need hit her back, we all felt that. Um, and I might have felt that differently from you just because I'm a woman and what that meant for this little girl. Um, and your experiences of, of seeing people it's um, it's hard, and that's kind of what I got from this. So, like, it's gonna be hard, and we don't have the answers because I don't think that they exist. Um, but do your best to live your life. You know what I'm saying? And so, just be your best person. Um, and so, I think a lot of us, and I can only speak for myself, is that's kind of what was ingrained in me. Um, not you know, keep your head down, and oh, I don't have to do that. You know, I'm a queen. We're all, you know what I'm saying? And a lot of people don't see that, and they're not going to see it. But you know that in yourself. And so um, I think it's hard. I'm not a boy. Police don't bother me. You know, like, and I think about my brother all the time. Like, what does he have to go through? And I hope that he doesn't have these experiences. Or have, my dad never had this conversation with him. But um, it's, it's just going to be difficult. And you just have to take everything. The 
both is and how yeah. people engage with each other because yeah. this point of view to me was so narrow yeah. to that wait, uh, yeah. wait, wait, wait one second. Did yeah. you read the part where he's talking about oh, navigating yeah. France? Oh, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. But, yeah. And so like to what you said, he does do that. And he says well, about he what? Well, he did it. And I mean, it seemed like he was just scared as hell. Like but that, but, so, but see, but that's what the, that's, and sort of like to make this a, a broader narrative because what's, you know, amazing about this book is as much as we love to do this is a race book this is a black book this is an american book right because the way the american mind works is that it's always been narrowly focused on its own it seldomly reaches to outside narratives to talk about like well, well let's look over here it only does that to scare you into loving America. Well, if you want to go to this country, John Chapel, and it's like, so it's in no way. No, no, so it's like, in what you, that fear of the farm is what he explores in his book. And like, it's different languages for that fear. Whether it be the fear of, like you said, whether it's like the fact that you're more afraid of the police officers and the dudes that you see killing each other. The fact is, is that those dudes killing each other are familiar to you. Those dudes always have been killing each other. You grew up with those dudes killing each other. So there's a certain approximation to it that makes you go, that's okay. Now, in the same thing, these cops is a little bit more distant because I don't know these police. And he says that around the time when he talks about the 9-11, he was like, the people that killed Mike, I mean, the people that killed Prince Jones were no different in his mind than the, than the cops and firefighters that died 9-11. Now, to be able to say those are the same people or to say that they're no different would mean that they're so foreign in your mind that they're alien. You can't conceive of them as an existence. So the thing for Paris was, was explaining like I felt like I had no reason to travel unless there was a reason. And you hear that all the time when you ask a lot of people, wait, why do you travel more? What do I need to go to China for? What's in China that's not like in New York? And it's like that sort of like privileging where you are and that like only America, like even like the fact that we call America, America like there's in the South, <laughs> And then like, you know, so it's like, we're Americans, but it's like, so what are like Peruvians? Are they not Americans too? So it's like, the, our whole language is constructed in such a way that we're not even allowed to even travel with the words we use. And so I know somebody else raised their hand. I uh, want to get, you ain't the source. Um, I agree that, I like the idea that, so he went to France, and he saw that like an eye-opening experience. Yeah. Um, and then, like it so much that he bought his son and his wife back that summer when he was in Um But at some point he said that he wanted his son to continue traveling and keep him an open mind. Um, but he wanted his son to remember that his black body, no matter where he goes, is still his black body. And obviously it's something that he can't escape. Um, I think his biggest issue is that no matter how open you are, no matter how educated you are, um, especially considering what happened to Prince Jones, um, there was a black kid who, who was educated, he went to Howard, and then that didn't stop him from being done that. Yeah. Like that's, I think, no matter what happens, mm. especially with the issue in America right now, is that, you know, like, Sandra Bland, she was going to work at a university. And she was locked up for three days for, regardless of whether she did or didn't kill herself, whatever it was, she was still locked up for three days just because she, quote, took the light out. Yeah. 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 The charge just, just like changed everybody. Yeah. Like, yeah. Which is quite ridiculous, you know? Which is, it's quite ridiculous. So, regardless of, you know, um, that, that's his issue with his son is that his son is now but he's 15 or 16. He's going to go out into the world and and then you know he can do all the right things and just one little thing, one little it could be he can have a bad day and curse out a cop. And now he doesn't have the right to curse. You can't be mad. You can't be mad or get an attitude or no matter what you do, no matter you know the right upbringing, no matter who your father is. Especially if, you know, like he's right now, like, folks is like extremely famous because of this book. But people, he's not like Kanye West. People aren't going to recognize him. Right. Really yeah. him. So his son, in two or three years from now, he's yeah. out in the world doing this thing. And 
So like to have a language that says, no, your body is threatening mine. It was like, it allowed for people to go, like I'm uncomfortable. But without that language, you can't even say that. So to be able to utter what your body feels is like revolutionary in a sense. And so to the part, like and I, what you said about the parenting is that a lot of times parents don't have language. And what you see is a book with a parent as verbose as he is, is still looking for it. And he, what he's saying is like, whether I find it or not, boy, the language is not up to me to give you. And so it's sort of a double narrative of like talking to his son while also talking to the reader, and then talking to the country at large. It's like, don't look at me, which is ironic what we're doing. Hey, Tana, he what you think about this? What you think about this? But it's like, the way we, you know, re like revere our celebrity, and are famous is we want them to answer our lives. And it's like every, and that's what you get when you get those interviews. It's like, what do you think about this? Because you know, if Beyonce thinks of like this, then that means I'm right. It's not about like, well maybe Beyonce's politics of how she exists has nothing to do with your body. Because in reality, Beyonce don't know your body exists. And even if she knows of your body or she knows your body intimately, and that's why I think the title comes in, is that between, there's a, there's like as close as we are is as far as we really like we really like we really are because I could sit right next to him and we could see the same thing and have a different reaction and then in, at that point that we go damn y'all thought you seen him all the way we standing for you like nah man I come from this and you're like oh shit I gotta look at you different and I think that's what the whole book is about is like as close as I am father to son there are certain things I'm never going to be able to navigate for you and so do with that I mean uh, burn my Yes. <laughs> I guess that goes about those on the just saying that like, how two people could be from similar backgrounds react differently because that goes what we were talking about yesterday. Yeah. You asked me how, how my test was, and I'm just like, like, I don't react to a lot of things, whether it's race or like, something that's hard because it's just like, I was always raised to just, you just have to do what you have to do. Like, I told my mother, I have to take it and catch yourself. Like, <laughs> and like we never really talked about race that much in my house because it's like I grew up in that style because like until maybe five years ago we were gonna be, I didn't have any white neighbors so it was like my mother, my mother worked for the United Nations but most of the people that she worked with were like Middle Eastern or African American she didn't really work with white people so she never had to come home and just like hey watch out for this or like go around like or watch out for this or do this or anything like that I went to school when I went to Brooklyn Tech, it was a diverse school, but most of the time I hung out with black people. But like, when my grandmother would take me away on vacations and stuff, then I would interact with white people. But I didn't feel afraid, I didn't feel like I was separate from them, because I was in the same environment with them, eating the same food, and watching the same sights. So it's like, I never felt like I was apart from them or anything like that. That's why sometimes when people always, like, it angers me when people blame like there's things that are going on today on like like a race as a whole. It's not that it's just a couple of crazy idiots that can walk out like walk in that town in a few, but it's like not everyone has these ideas. Yes, there is white privilege and yes, there is black privilege. Because like we were saying earlier, he like you could be a rich person like with, like um, his son and you could walk out of society and a cop can stop a cop can stop me cops never really stopped me for anything that I probably wasn't doing. It wasn't like I didn't think about oh why did he, why did he stop me or why should I stop I wasn't doing anything wrong. Like, if a cop had stopped me it's because I probably was doing something wrong. I'm glad you got that story. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you got that story. I, I wish that was the case for like more people like yeah. but um you done? Not, not not like like that. <laughs> 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 But what I will say is that I shared your experience and what you said about reading the book and like not having anybody there. I was like, yo, anybody um, here? Like, talk about the book too. So I wonder, I, and I don't want to like fuck up your format or whatever. Like, I don't know. But like, I want to ask if I can ask everyone, if whoever's willing to share, if you could just share like what part, if there was a part that like got you more than the other part or why like it pertains to you. Because like, 
if we go by a group, I bet you'll like never make like the whole thing. Um, and Can so I? I, I really yeah, no. It's okay. just, who has it told? I really want to get some yeah. other. Yes, please. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. You can. I'm gonna get you. Since you just mentioned that, we touch on it. Something from the beginning when I first started it, I was like, we need something on what he's touching on, and it's also like what you said about America as a whole, and that's one part I love that you mentioned that America as a whole holds themselves to this high standard compared to other countries and things like that, and it also touches on um, not talking to your children. And I think part of the problem is society as a whole has forgotten that these these things have happened before, and that's what I thought was great about how he wrote this is that he's not just talking to his son. When I read it, I'm like, he's talking to me, like he's talking to minority as a whole, like he's talking to everybody and saying like, don't wait until your child goes into that room and is upset about it because it's almost like, why are you upset? Because he didn't know that this is something that has gone on, and it's almost like these conversations need to happen sooner because these are things that happened back with Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and with the and all these people. But it's like now kids are surprised and it's because that's why I felt when you mentioned Instagram and things like that, because they're clouded by all this social media. They're like, wait, this is something that happened when my grandparents were young and these are things like that. And that's what I thought he did really well in the book is that he tells us what we're doing wrong. Like to me it feels like as said he didn't grow up with a black president, and it's almost like he's telling his kid what the benefits of him growing up are now, but those are also the problems with him growing up now. It's like you have a black president, so you think everything is good, like this was one big step, which it was, and it's amazing, but we're also forgetting, like, there's still so many issues going on, and that's something I thought was really amazing. I think it's such a job to touch me when I Listening to this conversation, this book. I'm a, I'm, my daughter is 20. So when he's talking to his son, it's like every time I'm reading, and let me say this, and I'll finish with the book. Every time. <laughs> but anyway, but um, one thing that, let me just, the guy and I, when we met, the thing that attracted me to this guy is that he's just like my daughter. They always read. Like my daughter got a book, I see this guy with a book. So that was like our connection. And I told him, I was like, you just like my kid. You all ever read? I don't read for fun. I read for information. I'm a different type of reader. So reading this book, the Don pushed me like to get books. But anyway, when reading this, I'm thinking about the whole day and the trade and things. It's like, I could, I go back and I can think about my daughter and my kids. Like, I can think about when we had discussions the trade for a month. And I'm always leaving things open. I want to hear from her like that. Or I just want her to tell me about what she faces. My daughter, I, I went to school in Texas. I, I lived back and forth between Houston and New York. So my daughter, high school, is in Texas. Uh, her mother and I, her mother's an educator. I was a teacher. So we're both like, very, we were both like, okay, we wanted to go to a certain type of school. I was very big on diversity being in New York. We're in Houston, I went around as many people from as many different places as possible, and I don't want her where it's just a part of Houston where it's just black, white, and Hispanics. I want her where it's as much diversity as possible. My mom the same way, okay. So she has a lot of friends from a lot of different backgrounds growing up. Social media. First thing, MySpace. You can see a whole international thing on the page, you know, the top friends. You can see all different types of women. And then it goes to junior high school, and you can see this, you know, on Instagram, Facebook, and it's all types of kids. And her first reaction is like, life is not roses, is when Trayvon Martin did. And Facebook, people who she was friends with, who she thought she was friends with, was saying the wildest things. And I'm reading her stuff, but I'm on the wait till she talked to me about it, because she reads my stuff. And I'm a different, I mean, I'm like, uh, I, I don't even want to get there, but let me just say this, like, when I was, when that part, when I read that part, I, I went straight back to my brain, so when, I'm reading her thread with Trayvon Martin the next day. 
but she got a picture of Skittles on her as a profile picture. And I'm just, and I'm, I'm just seeing, and I'm looking at her little comments. And she subliminal messages. She's not like putting it out there. She's subliminal messages. She's saying something like, uh, "You thought such and such was a friend, but bye, I'm friends with you."
talked about discipline. So when you said the whipping is like getting beat. So the mother would say, um, I'll take your body before they take it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, that's related to me because my father was disciplined just yeah. like that. I mean, and now I understand more now when I'm on the street what you meant by it. Yeah. Right? Now you understand when I say, I'm going to take your body. Don't let him take it. But don't let the cops take it. Right, right, right. Now you understand the concept of the whole thing. You got to walk a certain way. You got to talk a certain way. You got to respond to them a certain way. You know, because they already look at you. It's just a piece of me. Right. So, so I'm gonna just, I got to tie it a little bit now. But I think to your point, to bring it sort of full circle again back to what you said about teaching just love as opposed to fear. As a parent. As a parent. No, no, no. I'm not, I'm, and that's, I'm just going to keep it there. I think that one of the greatest intimacies that have historically been brought from certain bodies, bodies of color, is the intimacy that parents, that they're like, a parent had ownership of their child, meaning that that was immediately robbed. And like, so when James Baldwin spoke about what the country did to him, as it made, he said it made, it made him despise his father. When, he, when you grow up, your father and your mother are your gods. And so when you see a person come into your house and talk to your mother in a way you know you can never talk to her, and you're watching for her reaction to see how are you going to handle this, and you see they cower their heads, it's like you lose respect for your parent. You can no longer worship your parent. And so what he's what he did in terms of that power of let me have this conversation with you. Because if I have this conversation with you first, I still have that connection with you. I still have that intimacy with you. And like I can say that part of you is still mine. Whereas before, this could never exist. You there was generations of, and he says it in the book, there were generations upon generations where these conversations were mum. And so the concept that my father knew what I knew was completely unawares until it happened to me. And so the fact that now it can happen to Mike Brown and he can say, you know what, let me step into my son and talk to him about this, as opposed to like when we're both in jail, because a lot of young men, black men find their fathers for the first time when they get locked up and they go, this is where you've been the whole time. And so it's just, it's just a, that in itself is a psychological war thing. So I think that like to end the, like, the discussion for today is that I think that one of the things this book does well is it sort of like plays out a lot of conversations we all have or want to have with ourselves and others and um, that intimacy between bodies is what I think he wants to be a more part of the struggle is to be consciously aware of your whiteness my blackness and what it's always doing because at one moment yes it is I can be poor and then I can very well be rich and that little thing changes my body a little bit. It may not stop me from getting shot by the cops, but it may allow me to get, you know, maybe they won't stop me outright and shoot me. They go, boy. And, but that little moment that that happens is like you have to be aware of what your body is doing at all times. So it's a sort of vigilance that I think, if anything, he's saying that if you are struggling in this world, be vigilant and don't ever like allow yourself to dream. So I think we'll end there. And thank you for a first one.